will be kicking off the formal part of the proceedings this morning at about 10.30, so help yourself to some food. Uh, that is t-shirt pickup for all the gold members who have registered. We appreciate that for the pre-registration and signing up for the gold member services. just because it's cycling without the cars. You can just kind of go anywhere you want and you don't have to worry about tricks and cars. So, um, I, uh, <laughs> oh, come on, you all know that feeling too. You're all gonna be like, yeah, I know, they're not very nice sometimes. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I can get out on the lake or in the ocean in Victoria and go explore. And it's uh, a lot of peace and quiet time. Uh, I've been learning how to surf, which is fun. I haven't been on a road bike in a year and a half, more maybe. I think I went through, that was like your last yeah, time yeah, yeah. back here. I think I we did it together. I don't have a road bike anymore, which I quite like. Um, and I haven't been for a run other than uh, the beach uh, in, I can't even, I don't know, a year maybe. Um, so yeah, I haven't been doing very much triathlons. So, so that's almost a complete break and people are often surprised because I, I, I know I talk to people and they're going like, what is he doing? They, they think you're still training like a madman. So how is, it, how is it that that transition from where you were at, one of the best triathletes in the world to, to what you're doing now? How, is it, how did you manage mentally and physically that transition? That's a big question. Um, it's a really difficult transition actually. You go from... Uh, 30 hours, 30 odd hours, whatever you want to count it as, uh, of exercise a week, which I didn't realize till later is 30 odd hours of being alone and 30 odd hours of basically what you can call active meditation. I mean, you are actively, you know, you're engaged in something, you're thinking so specifically, you do 10 by a K on the track and you are focused. And to take that away and go to three hours a week of casual exercise, chatting with a friend, uh, I paid a big cost for that without really realizing it. Um, and so all of a sudden when you don't have that opportunity and you don't have an excuse or a reason or it's not your job uh, and you've got two little kids to chase around, that's a lot less time alone. In fact, that's a tenth of the time alone. And that's a hard, that's a big transition after 25 years of a lot of alone time, a lot of very concentrated thinking on sport to go to uh, not having that was difficult. Yeah, very difficult. That's where the stand-up came in was it's a very concentrated amount of time, but you can be alone, which is critically important for a lot of us. And when you were when you were the age of some of our uh, developmental athletes coming up back in your late teens, early 20s, did you ever imagine that it would go to the level that it did for you? Yes. So yeah, I don't know, I got into triathlon, I loved it, it's such a wonderful sport, as you know, it's just such a, it's a community sport, uh, it's very, uh, it's intense, it, it requires such dedication, but to learn that early on, and, and the opportunity the young athletes have now is incredible, to be able to race around the world, and the support that's there, the coaching that's there, the infrastructure that's around them. Um, I will say I still, we have so far to go in terms of high performance athletes and what that really means, what that really encompasses, but uh, Canada's doing a great job and on a triathlon level, a terrific job. I mean, that team's very strong, good at both male and female, very, very fast, very good at all three. It's a, it's a tough circuit. It's always evolving very quickly from what I tell them, and my sense is it's, it's even different. It's a different sport now in terms of the performance characteristics required to be truly great than it was when, when you were competing. Is, is, is that correct? They're faster now. I mean, I can't do anything Brownlee can do. Um, I could never could. Um, but in saying, I don't know, at this end of the day, it's still a two hour endurance challenge that requires. Uh, I, I went to Yorkshire and spent two days with Alistair and Johnny over Christmas. And uh, you see why they win. It has nothing to do with. Uh, anything beyond where they came from and how focused they are and how much they think it. In my opinion, success in anything is how much you think about it. Um, and they've been thinking about triathlon since they were competing as two brothers uh, since the beginning of time for them. You can add all the science to it, you can add all the talent, you can add all the hard work. The person who is the most, thinks about it the most and the most 
efficient and focused manner is, uh, it, I think, is the person who ends up winning. Does it all, all, at that level, does it almost become an obsession? Almost? Does it need to be? <laughs> does it need to be? No, it is. It's, it's a requirement. A, no, it is a requirement. I, it, unfortunately, it's a requirement. Um, but there's not a lot of balance in high performance sport. And if you're looking to go into it and find balance and perform at the highest level in whatever it is you do, whatever category you're in, it takes it takes losing a couple screws. Takes, you have to have a couple screws loose to do that. Uh, you have to be fairly obsessed. I'm not sure it's the healthiest obsession, but it's what's required. Um, like I said, if you spend time with the Brownleys and you think you're going to beat the Brownleys, then go spend two days with them and ask yourself very seriously, like, do I put in as much as those guys do? Not just time. I mean, like, have I forever put in that much competitiveness? Do I believe in myself in that manner? And am I that focused? Am I willing to make the sacrifices that those two have made to to be at the level that they're at? And the same in the women's. I mean, Gwen Jorgensen is wholly committed. I don't know if it's a healthy obsession, but she's wholly committed. You're a parent of two wonderful uh, girls. How many parents have kids in sports? What parents can do and what kids can do yeah. about sport and sport development, particularly at the younger age, let's say sub-teenage years. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? What am I, my goal? Um, well, my daughters are seven and five, so we're not into any competitive sport, and I don't know if they will be. I don't know. Um, they play soccer right now because it's fun. It's a Saturday activity. I coach. I'm terrible. They're terrible. That's good. Oh, they're terrible. I mean, terrible. My daughters are terrible. So I'm uh, they're terrible swimmers, which is great too. I mean, terrible as in like they're, they love it. We were so talking about jeans uh, before. Well, they're happy jeans, but they have terrible slacks because they're not good swimmers. Um, no, they're great. I mean, we have so much fun, but we do so much more than just sport. And for me, it's uh, everything with the girls is about I, three things. Well, I guess four, but it's their, it's writing, it's sketching, it's music, and it's sport, and it's an even distribution of all of them. So. I mean, I, I just want them to enjoy sport and find the same love I have for sport. I'm just a pickup sports junkie. I played, I scored three goals the other day at indoor soccer. I don't know if any of you know this, but I'm telling you now. They were really good goals. I even used my left foot at one point, which is a new thing for me, playing soccer. So, uh, yeah, no, I want my kids to grow up and just have a love of sport. And we, you talked about the mental and the physical transition and how stand-up paddleboarding is, is, is a good substitute for you. What else are you involving yourself? I know you, you sort of immersed yourself uh, in business. Mostly, are you making that up? I made that up. I had a, it was in the interview and I just had to ask the question. Um, no, I, I don't know. Business is fun. I like it. Um, I'm involved in a lot of really interesting things. Um, uh, it's, yeah, as everybody here knows, trying to make a living with kids or without kids, it's an interesting journey. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. I enjoy the people I work with. Um, I work with a group in Victoria that does what I call vision forward work, I, for lack of a better term, but they just do a fantastic job of helping people lay out where they're headed, the direction that they're going. Um, and really helping them get an, well, help me get an understanding of, okay, instead of just what's the next thing I'm doing, and then I'll look up and figure out where I'm going, and then I'll do the next thing, and the next thing is really figuring out where I want to get to. And I don't mean like a year from now, I mean like describing out loud where you want to live in 20 years is a very powerful thing to do. And then working backwards, okay, three years before that, if I know in theory, where I want to live in 20 years, then three years before that, I probably need to live, you know, I need to be most of the way there. And then three years before that, and then three, and then bringing that all the way down to, and this is what I used to do in my triathlon career, was really break it down to three month blocks, and then three week blocks, and then three day blocks. And just keep making it manageable things, but having a really clear intention of where you're going. Instead of just kind of heading off into the abyss of, I hope I do well. I learned that in sport, I'm not sure I could articulate it back then, but through business and that too. Two last questions. Best thing ever happened to you in triathlon? Worst thing, let's start with the worst. The worst thing that worst ever thing. happened. Even the bad experiences were great experiences. The London crash, it would be easy to say that was the worst experience, but I wouldn't trade that for the world. I don't know, that's not a real worst experience. Being sick, yeah, I did a French Iron Tour in 1997. That dates me a little bit, because you guys weren't born yet, but um, uh, it was eight races in nine days, so next time you're complaining about where we're doing, it was eight races in nine days, including two Olympic distance over an eight-day period. And 
all the other teams had these huge, you know, fancy trailers and everything. And uh, Stefan Jacobson from Nanaimo, myself, Frank Clark from uh, Vancouver, and two random dudes, one of which turned out to be Rasmus Henning, who went on to be incredible. And he was just a guy that was kind of donated to our team. Like, I don't know, here, take the Danish guy. Um, we, we did really well and in this eight races in nine days, but I got, uh, I, we swam in Montpellier in there in the in the city hall fountain, around and round and round, and I and I beat Simon Lessing for the first time ever, and then the next day was violently ill for whatever duck shit I took in, <laughs> and so I went from the highest high like I just beat my hero. I'm 21 years old. I just made money for the first time. I'm he's undefeated in 18 months. And I'm the guy that knocked him off, and the next day I'm lying in the mud. Um, shivering and throwing up everywhere, and I came last by 10 minutes. So I went from the highest high to the lowest low. So, yeah. so was that the best and worst all in 24 sure. hours? Sure, yeah. Well, so that and Lessig wouldn't shake my hand. I went to shake his hand after I beat him. I was like, yes, I beat Simon Lessig. And he was like, no. For, for those of you who don't. He called me a little shit the next race. I swear to God. He did. We were running together and we went through this little tunnel and then there was no fans anywhere and he turned to me and he said, Look, you little shit. <laughs> if you have sprint me again, there's going to be trouble. And I was like, All right, let's do this. It was... For those of you who don't know who Simon Lessing before was or is, before this Simon, he was generally regarded as the greatest triathlete in the world. He is. I mean, Alistair, Alistair and Simon Lessing are the greatest they ever raced. The most talented, the hardest workers, the highest level we've ever seen. If Lessing was racing now, he'd be going head to head with Brownlee. He's just that kind of athlete. Um, the sport just changed him at the wrong time for him, and he couldn't accept it. But, uh, he was an unbelievable athlete, as good as they can. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all that with us. Appreciate it. person you spend all of your time with. Um, 
you should know. You should know how, what's going on internally, what's going on from, from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint. And obviously it's, a, it's an adaptation, it's something you have to learn. But uh, if you're not paying attention to those details, if you're, not, if you're just taking the nutrition advice and not retaining it, and you're not thinking about... I th the thing I reference now all the time is, what would your 80-year-old self say to you? What would your 80-year-old self, if you could talk to that person, what would they, they would say, don't, don't do that. Don't go doing that. That's stupid. I don't want that. Her question that she really wants to know is, are you going to go do an iPad? I'm going to do one with some friends one day. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna do some Iron Man somewhere with uh, my housemate and a bunch of buddies and we're going to do the swim together. This is how the race is going to go. The gun goes off and then we're going to wait for a bit. <laughs> and then I'm going to turn to Adrian and I'm like, you did not train for this, are you ready? And he's going to say no and I'm going to say, okay, let's go. And then four or five of us, probably Southie, myself, a bunch of us will do it, the swim together and kind of stay together. And we're going to get to the, the transition and I'm going to help them <laughs> get their stuff together. And then we're going to go for a 180k bike ride together. And we're going to draft like crazy. We're going to draft the whole way. I don't care. And if you give me a penalty and make me sit in a booth, then I'm good with that. Uh, you can penalize me all you like, and because uh, I scored three goals in indoor soccer, so I don't care. Um, and then we're gonna set off on a run together and with glow sticks, and Adrian's gonna suffer, and I'm not, and that's how I'm gonna do an Ironman. Awesome. But I'll do one like that. <laughs> you guys want to do it with me? We'll all go do it together. Oh, family. Three, two, one.